Hello there and welcome to 10 advanced tips and tricks for base building and base defense in Diplomacy is not an option. This is sort of a follow-up video to my beginner's tips and tricks video and I hope it'll help you to get a good footing into the mid and late game for this nice little game here. So, let's get started with number one. You should really produce as much timber as possible right from the get-go. It is no shame to plot down as many lumber mills as you can possibly afford, because wood is your number one export product in the early stages of the game. You should always try to export wood, preferably as the very first thing, because getting forest's cabins is a pretty easy thing eventually, and you will just have pretty good options with that to get the gold that you need to upgrade your buildings because that brings me directly to number two. A race to the tier three town hall is your big milestone goal after walling yourself in basically. The tier three town hall allows you to do many things but most importantly it unlocks the highest tier units which are really really powerful and high tier siege weapons more about that in a few minutes but most importantly it unlocks also all the stone walls and uh, university things so you're finally free to specialize the way you want to you should though never neglect your survival it's always survival first and then the town hall remind mind you that number three i want to talk a bit about the good old fella the crossbowman your crossbowman is the top line of defense in your in your roster. This little guy here will be standing on all your walls, towers, and be shooting these whatever you're fighting. These guys can therefore be printed in you in whatever amounts you want to do, to uh, to produce them. Because once you hit tier three, you will not get any other ranged options there. The Hammer Guy and the Foot Knight are both melee units, and when it comes down to reach ranged units for base defense, the Crossbowman is just the, the best option that you can go for. When you go for some research, I highly recommend to research, therefore, the skills of the Crossbowman as quick as possible, because you get a huge payoff out of these. It also is very much worth it to disband archers and replace them with crossbowmen as soon as you have unlocked them. Number four, I want to talk about a little bit about cavalry and namely the horse archers. Horse archers are the best unit that I've found so far for just random cle clearing stuff on the map. They're fast, they're ranged, and most importantly, they're mostly unimpressed by enemy catapults and other siege engines that stand around because they are hardy. They can't be thrown around by explosions, which means even if they get hit, they are not going to get ragdolled. And uh, yeah, these, these guys are, for me, my number one exploration units. Also, they're very, very handy inside your base. But inside your base, they will get replaced by the Mounted Knight, which is your uh, top-notch um, emergency unit, which can just go wherever things are going out of control. But horse archers, to sum it up, are really, really powerful, and I personally can't recommend them enough to pick them up as quick as you can, because at that point, from that point on, as you see there, you can pretty much pick up whatever you want from the map. It's just only a matter of patience from that point on. They have decent HP, they're fast enough to go out of uh, most danger, and unless you're playing some devilishly hard map, they will get you through those things quite easily. If you have harder things at hand, of though, of course, probably would need to switch strategies. Number five, upgrades of stone and uh, iron mines. Stone, you know, stone mines, I will call them quarries, but uh, this is something that I really want to stress out. You should really try to build as few stone mines early on as you can. It's a little bit of a finicky thing, because you get so much more out of it as soon as you upgrade them. So you see there, it increases the extract by two times. This means you get double the amount of stone out of these. This means if you have large deposits somewhere, it might be worth waiting. You can also get the triple amount of uh, stone if you upgrade it a third time. Once you have the tier 3 town hall but don't stress it out too much you will eventually most of the time find on the map 
eternal stone deposits. They they look like a, a very wide deposit. This one's uh, one of these. So on these you can put a endless uh, production thing, but I want to talk about these in a hot minute. What I want to get down to, try to upgrade stone mines and iron mines when you can, as quick as possible, because it will or increase the output of these uh, locations tremendously, even up to the point that sometimes I even delay building mines up until I can upgrade them. You should have at all points, to give you some markers, at least three quarries, though, to get safely into the uh, production cycle. I would even pro uh, recommend four to get to the town hall tree quickly enough and get your fortifications going. Don't stress out too much on... Uh, pondering about lost um, deposits there too much, but you should also know that this is a thing and upgrade them therefore as quick as possible. Number six, I want to talk about siege machines a little bit. So first up, the catapult is your best friend early on and you should totally get yourself a quarter of these on a massive tower as quick as you can. They're pretty multifunctional, they're pretty powerful, but they will get replaced totally by the Ballista eventually. Ballista is just the better catapult. As soon as you can afford them, just replace them. Then there's the Trebuchet. The Trebuchet is a high range weapon that, uh, well, needs some distance from the wall. As you see here, this blank space in the center, this is where this thing can't fire. If I would be putting the trebuchets on these towers here, it wouldn't be able to reach anything in front of the wall, which would be bad. As you see here, the positioning here gives us full access to, to the entirety of the walls. Therefore, trebuchet towers need to be put back a little bit. You can also afford to go for the cheaper massive towers for these, not for the uh, bigger ones, because at the end of the day, these will be the last thing that will be overrun, and therefore we don't need the costly ones. Put the costly ones in front of this much more. And the towers in front of the, uh, or, or very close, the massive ones as you see there, are best manned, in my opinion, with ballistae. As you see there, the ballistas can safely reach everything here, and uh, this is just how you use them. And they are, these things are the real upgraded ranged units in tier 3. You don't get foot troops, but you get those siege engines and they're stupidly powerful. One last thing to note, configure them to attack the strongest target and not the nearest target, at least the trebuchets. With a ballista you could uh, argue a little bit differently yes, since they have punched her, but uh, personally prefer strongest target on these as they deal pretty massive amounts of damage. Number seven, I want to talk about walls and towers. As you see here, I have given already a few uh, pieces of advice, but uh, here I want to point it out. There is always a layer of wall in front of the tower. Very important, because if you put, put the tower in front of the wall, the enemy is allowed to chew on the tower directly. Tower falls, troops fall down to the ground, and uh, it's much easier for the enemy to breach. This setup forces the enemy to chow through the wall first, before they can even start touching the tower, and in the meantime, and you can let all the damage rain down on the enemy that you want. Also, feel free to triple layer. Double layer, to be personally, this is the minimum, but if you can't afford it, triple layering, no problem, pretty good. So, when it comes down to towers, you also have the option to go for these watchtowers. These are mostly for scouting purposes, but uh, they can also work as an impromptu um, platform for your troops if you need one quickly built and you don't have stone available. Don't sneeze at them as they have the same capacities as the stone ones and they can be very very useful in a pitch. So don't you think they only have these uh, wooden ones for nine troops. Very very important to me personally. So number eight traps and distractions. So obviously we can use slowing traps and I can say you should not underestimate them. They're pretty cool. So basically you could just uh, plaster this entire place here, just like that. That's one solution. As you see there, it doesn't even really uh, hurt my wood stockpiles. And it's a small location. Sure, it only brings 30% uh, slow, slowage to the enemy, but every little thing counts. And before you don't know what to do with your wood anymore, that's one option. But the other option, what I also personally really like to do, are distractors. So you can put up either 
something like this, where you just uh, put up little bits of wall here in between to uh, distract the enemy, or even go as far as placing down towers here. This setup here will provoke the enemy troop to stand in front of your defenses and waste their time on absolutely insubstantial parts of your uh, castle. Eventually, enemies will always splash um, past these uh, distractor parts, but uh, I personally find it extremely valuable to have things like these, and uh, yeah, they pay. Th these things pay off tremendously. That's all I can say. Now, number nine, endless resources. I've already uh, glanced that. Uh, topic a little bit, but uh, I really need to talk about it. So the moment you have tier 3 town halls, you have also the ab ability to unlock the university. This point unlocks, gives you the ability to unlock the eternal stone sources for 500 timber and eternal iron sources for 250 stone. From that point on, you are completely uh, free to build however you want to once you have access these. So iron ore fields come in the water and uh, the uh, stone ore fields come at the uh, mountain ranges. These are therefore highly valuable um, strategical positions that you should totally scout out and uh, orient your base building towards to. If you know that your late game uh, endless stone resources somewhere, you surely can build your fortress towards that direction and uh, you know, it just helps a lot. All right, I think this is uh, one thing that uh, that comes pretty clear, and obviously the forester's uh, hut is uh, pretty much a no-brainer as well. It does cost you a little bit of uh, gold, but I personally think it is gold well spent, because at the end of the day you can see it like this. You spend gold for a building that produces wood, which you can then export to get more gold. At the end of the day, the forester pays for himself. Okay, so I think I have made my point about endless resources. You should go for them. They are the solution for your finite resources, and you should orient your base building towards these. That's pretty much the gist of it. Number 10, a couple of things about logistics. First of all, these storages, they never hurt to be put in between. But I personally made a few um, things. I personally observed a few things. It's totally paying off to have an exclusive iron storage in the vicinity of your iron mines. Because as you see there, something like this can quickly happen if you don't pay attention, like I did here. So what has happened here is that the iron miners now need to go all the way up to the castle or this storage or whatever storage is free to deliver their product. Therefore, it really doesn't hurt to have some extra storages just exclusive for some uh, rarer material because as you see there it doesn't hurt if it's just filled a little bit but what does hurt is to cut your productivity into uh, bits and pieces just because you have not um, enough storage configured, configured like this. So for example, this little change here will increase my daily iron production by a lot. These little things can mean, therefore, also a lot. So you can help yourself with storages exclusively for wood in the vicinity for your, of your woodcutters or stone stockpiles. Oh, you, you see what I'm talking about. Also, I want to introduce this little packet here. So here you see, this is my typical housing donut. There is a city fountain in the vicinity which pumps up the power of these and it's encircled by regular houses and accompanied by taverns. You can, of course, choose to your own liking how you want to string up these for your own uh, base, but at the end of the day, something like this pays very, very well because you want to save as much room in general as possible because room is very valuable. Room can be used either for population or for food production, ultimately. And these two things allow you to scale up your power really quite quite a lot, you know. So, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's very, very simple things about uh, configuring uh, your, your stockpiles and building your housing accordingly that help out a lot. And last but not least, build your housing always as close as possible to the castle 
and try to be as far away as possible from the walls. I mean, obvious reasons, but I want to stress it out here again. If there is a wall breach, it helps a ton to have your um, to have your citizens as far away from the from the baddies as possible. And uh, planning that right from the get go is a very helpful little thing. All right, my friends, there's obviously way more to uh, say about these topics. But that's all that I have for this video. I hope it helped you out. Let me know in the comments below what you would have uh, liked to see or if you have anything to add there. I'm all ears. Apart from that, leave a like, leave a subscribe, consider checking out the description box and be so kind to support Icon Gaming financially. If you'd be so kind, I'd be very, very, very happy. So, thanks for watching yet again. Thanks a lot for supporting if you do so. And have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.